Hi, I'm Dr. John Neufeld with Back to the Bible Canada. It's my joy to invite you to come with us on our Israel experience, encounter God in the Promised Land. Few experiences prepare you for the ascension up the hills to Jerusalem on a stroll along the Sea of Galilee, the very place Jesus walked and taught. An Israel experience is just that, a combination of sights and sounds, the modern amongst the ancient, locations making real the stories of the Bible, and allow us to gaze upon scrolls of scripture text unchanged for thousands of years. This is the Holy Land and we invite you to join Back to the Bible Canada for the Israel Experience. Hi, I'm Dr. John Neufeld. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. And, uh, I'm continuing to do a study on Ephesians chapter four, which is, I just think it's a great study. And uh, it's all about this transfer of, of ownership. Once we belong to the world and now we belong to the God who has created us and to the Christ who has saved us. Well, if you think about it, aren't there so many different um, illustrations or word plays that we learn from the Bible about what happens in the Christian life. We were brought from death into life. Uh, we were born again from above. We were transferred from the, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so we have citizenship in a new kingdom. And we've also learned that we are a kind of third race. Um, there is Jew and Gentile, and now there are the people of God. And so we've been brought from all the different cultures and countries of the world, and we've been made into a new country, the people of God. And then when we get to the Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter four, well, then we're gonna learn all about, you know, what it means to live within that reality. Now, the, the wide-reaching consequences of the new birth. Uh, if Christianity is anything at all, it is just radically countercultural. It, it calls us to reject the values of the culture that we live in and to embrace the, the new citizenship of the kingdom. And with that, we have this language that we find here in Ephesians 4, and it's the language of a wardrobe, a divine wardrobe. Now, uh, think of it this way. Uh, you might think, well, I, I don't understand the significance of receiving new clothes to wear. I mean, what does that actually mean? But if you think about it, just think about it in this way. You wouldn't show up for a wedding in work clothes, you know, coveralls and, you know, and working boots, you know, with, you know, a steel toes and all the other thing that goes with that. You wouldn't go to a wedding looking like that. Um, you know, you, you would, uh, you wouldn't go to a, um, uh, to change the oil in your car wearing a tuxedo. Um, you know that there are clothing that is appropriate for the occasion. And using that analogy, that's where we get to now in Ephesians chapter four. We have new clothing that we're called upon to wear. And I'm gonna spell that out for us in just a little while. But as we're thinking about that, let's read the text and I've got it on the, on the paper in front of me. So let me just read it. Ephesians chapter four, verses 17 to 24. Paul writes, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous, have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off, here's the language, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on, you know, just like clothing, put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. There's a mouthful, as is often the case in Paul's writings. Every word tends to be this, this weighty bomb, and we're invited to just think about what he's written and to contemplate how life-transforming this stuff is. So let me begin by saying that Paul says in this paragraph that I've just read that believers in Jesus must not live as the Gentiles do. So the first question that we need to ask 
You know, Paul's writing to the Ephesians. So how did the Ephesian Gentiles live? How did the culture of Ephesus get on? So, you know, I've written a number of characteristics here, and let me go through them. Ephesus was a pagan city. Now, very important for us to remember the, that Ephesus was an important city, and that by the end of the first century, the Christian presence of, in Ephesus had made Ephesus the center of the Christian world. So I mean, the, the gospel began to permeate that city. But when the gospel first got there, it was amazingly pagan. It boasted the great temple of Diana. She's depicted as the goddess of fertility and also the goddess of sex. Thousands of temple prostitutes that uh, did their wares there. And I remember going to visit the ruins of Ephesus and uh, it's, it's quite a sight to see. And uh, the guide that was taking us along uh, pointed out that, you know, here's the, the ruins of the old library. And across the road from the library was a huge brothel. And, you know, he, he tried to joke with us and said, you know, you could say to your wife, I'm going to the library, but there's actually an underground tunnel between the library and the brothel. And then I was alone with all of our own people that had come with me on the tour. And, uh, and I said to them, look, you need to understand something about Ephesus. You never, never said to your wife, honey, I'm going to the library and then snuck out to the brothel. That's how we would think today. In ancient Ephesus, they never thought that way. They said, honey, I'm going to the brothel. I mean, sexual um, uh, activity outside of marriage was just considered normal and uh, it was considered healthy activity, and that's how they thought about it. Well, the Temple of Diana was the center of spirituality and sensuality. And then around the temple, uh, surrounding the temple, is a quarter mile wide perimeter. And it served as an asylum for criminals from all over the Roman Empire. So if you got yourself close to the Temple of Diana, you couldn't be arrested anymore. And so because of this, hardened criminals from all over the empire made their way there. And the place was just rife with corruption and vice and drunkenness and uh, all sorts of bad behavior. So, and this combination with this amazing wealth in the city, uh, so that, you know, the moral virtues were, were pagan and the wealth was overwhelming. And it was the Greek philosopher, his name was Heraclitus. He was himself a pagan and he referred to Ephesus as follows. He says, it was the darkness of vileness. He says, the morals are lower than animals and the inhabitants of Ephesus are fit to be drowned. <laughs> so, that's what one pagan philosopher thought of the place. But then the gospel got there. You know, Paul preached the gospel to Ephesus and a number of people got saved. They became changed. And, and of course, as we've already said, they were now reckoning themselves as a new race. They were a, a new culture. Uh, they were a new people group that had accepted values and ways of living, ways of thinking and interacting with each other that was radically different from the culture around them. And uh, that now was their calling. So uh, they are called upon in the passage that I just read to take off the filthy clothing of Ephesus and now clothe themselves with the beautiful clothing of Jesus. So that's all fine and wonderful, but we need to ask ourselves this question, did they actually do it? I mean, did they live as a very different group of people? And by all indications, they did. And for us who, you know, sometimes hear about all manner of um, scandals in the church. We hear about you know, church leaders who have secret sexual affairs and trysts that are going on on the side, and then we discover it and it makes the newspaper or wherever it, it's found. I mean, we might be asking ourselves, I mean, how is it that they did that? And why is it so difficult for us to do that today? And, and I don't wanna you know, over uh, simplify matters. I, I do know that for myself, and I need to say this, having been in pastoral ministry for over 35 years and then now being a part of Back to the Bible for a number of years. Uh, so I've been in Christian ministry for well over 40 years. And in those 40 years, I've actually never worked with a clergyman whom I know to have been involved in sexual misconduct. So I, I'm just simply saying that uh, I think it is probably, um, you know, the things that we read about in the paper make it sound like it's far worse than it is. There are a great many godly men and women committed to Christ who are living faithfully according to the principles of Christ. And so I, 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 I don't want to overdo it. And yet at the same time, I want to say this, we've got to relearn what it means to take off the clothing of our culture and to say, I no longer identify with that. 
and I'm putting on the clothing of Christ, and that is my place of identity. My culture now is this. So that's what I want to say. So let's start at the beginning. We'll start back at verse 17. Paul writes, now this I say, and I testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So start here and notice that this is a divine command. Don't act as the Gentiles do. Don't share the culture of the Gentiles. It's a divine command. It is the will of God. Now, it's easy to say that, and you might say, yeah, but that's a little harder to do. And so how do you do that? And I think that Paul is going to answer that by giving us a number of reasons that we need to consider ourselves new in Christ. So here's reason number one. The Gentiles, says Paul, are intellectually futile. He uses the word futility here, futility in their minds, he says. So they're intellectually futile. So what does it mean? Well, first of all, the the Greek word for futile means empty, it means vain, and it means void of substance. Um, So let me kind of take that apart. You know, it seems surprising because if you think about it, Ephesus were you know, it was a city that was filled with intellectuals from the Greco-Roman world. And so, you know, there were plenty of philosophers in Ephesus. There was plenty of training in Ephesus. So you might say, how does Paul say, look, the culture around you is intellectually futile. In what sense? Well, all we need to do is to look at the rest of Paul's letters and what he says. So, for instance, in Romans 1, he teaches us that futility of thinking means exchanging the glory of God for idols. You know, and and idols means that we worship created things rather than the creator, that our center of affection that which we set our hearts on, the things that we love, the things that we think about in our spare time, the things that draw our attention are constantly the created things and not the creator. So Paul says that's futility of thinking. You've you've lost perspective because you don't concentrate on the one who made all things, rather the, you worship all the things that are made that indeed are passing away. And then Paul adds to that in Romans 1, is that the, the, the center of intellectual darkness is that we fail to give thanks to God for all things. Um, and so um, this, this complaining spirit, uh, this agitated spirit, it's this spirit of shaking a fist at God and say, God, why didn't you? And then, you know, you fill in the blank rather than to go before God and say, I'm overwhelmed with gratefulness for the kindness of your provisions in my life. So, says Paul, that's intellectual futility. We worship created things and we fail to give thanks to God for all things. So, you know, that Paul says you need to reject that. So let me challenge you with a little exercise. How about this? Go to the internet on the internet read a news organization's publication, listen to talk radio in the land, watch television, hear the national political leaders and politicians speak and listen to the topic of discussions in our intellectual institutions. How much talk is there in all of those forms of our infinite gratitude that we owe to God for all that we have? And the answer is, The topic never even comes up. In fact, every once in a while, when you listen to talk radio, they open it up and say, any topic will do. And nobody ever says, hey, here's the topic, our obligation to be grateful to our creator for all that we have. I mean, that almost never comes up. It's it's apart from our thinking. And so when Paul says, look, let me describe to you the Gentile pagan world, it's futility of thought. And he could be describing our culture as well. And so the first thing that we need to do before we say, look, we're going to act differently than the world, we need to understand how the world acts. The world acts with intellectual futility. It gets nowhere. So here's now the second reason for not following the world. Paul says they're ignorant of God's truth. And here we have verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Now, um, you know, many people who have, you know, have starred in a, in a famous movie or have won a major sporting event um, uh, are become the, the attraction for 
um, for what we admire. See, I'm always amazed at the trivia that people know in our culture. Um, they know who won a World Series or a, or uh, the Stanley Cup hockey game um, in, you know, I don't know, you know, 1996. I mean, they'll, they'll know it and exactly who scored the winning goal. I mean, they'll know all the details of these kinds of things. Um, and so they, they concentrate on matters that, again, as we've said before, um, that are this world centered. And uh, I do know that we're an educated culture, yet most of us don't know the truths about God. And, and Paul tells us why. He says the reason is due to the hardness of their hearts. Now, the term hardening, that's actually a medical term, and it speaks of, you know, a callus that forms on a bone or a fracture that's reset, and, and the callus is harder than the bone itself. And so intellectual futility means that there is an internal hardening against all information that comes to us about the Creator, the God who has made us. I mean, you sit down in a coffee shop, talk to a stranger and say, you know, how do you, what do you think of the weather that we're having? How do you think um, that my favorite hockey team is going to do? And if you're an NFL fan, you might mention that, or you might have mentioned, you know, a new movie that's just come out. I mean, what do you think about that? And, you know, people are willing to talk. But if you say, what do you think about our need to be thankful to God for all things? I mean, immediately a hardness develops and God talk seems out of sorts, you see. There's a callousness that's developed. Now comes the third reason why we must not live as the Gentiles do. And look at the beginning of verse 19. They have become callous. And the NIV says they have lost all sensitivity. And I know that's a paraphrase, but it's a really good one. They've lost sensitivity. They no longer have feeling. You know, a person who doesn't feel guilt, a person is, is also a person who is incapable of hearing from God. Um, you know, if you ask most Canadians today, um, do you think that you're a sinner? I mean, most Canadians will say, no, I do not think that. And if you wonder why people aren't searching around for who will save me in my sins is because of this callousness of the heart that's incapable of feeling the weight of our own moral culpability before God, which is our sin. So, so, Paul has been giving us reasons why we must not think or walk as the Gentiles do. Number one, futility of thinking. Number two, ignorant of God's truth. Number three, they've lost the capacity to feel moral guilt. And now he comes to reason number four. He says, the Gentiles have given themselves to a lifestyle of sensuality. And that's the last part of verse 19. And having given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, I'm going to say something about this that I do find fascinating. Um, I was uh, cued into this kind of way of thinking uh, some time ago um, when a, a professor in seminary brought this to my attention, and I've thought about it for years since. Uh, he said, look, every single human being, because we are not only thinking human beings, but we are also emotional beings, that we have the desire, not only the capacity to feel things, that we have the need to feel things. Now, now, here's the thing. When we become callous about the things of God, we no longer feel a overwhelming sense of gratefulness for God's kindness or feel our moral culpability for our sin and, the, and feel the need to come to God begging for mercy, forgiveness, and telling Him, I need a Savior. See, when we no longer feel these central issues to our own humanity, we still have to give ourselves to feeling something. Human beings need to feel something. Um, so sensuality, you know, that's what that Paul says here. That they've given themselves to sensuality. Sensuality is feeling driven. Having closed our minds off to the knowledge of God, we are now just propelled forward to feel in another area, and this area is in terms of our own sexuality. See, here's the question I've often asked. Uh, why so much sensuality? Um, you, you might be able to say, well, you know, I mean, we are also sexual beings, and we are. I mean, the sexual urge is a real human biological urge, and it is an urge that God has given us 
to be practiced within marriage, which also not only becomes an expression of intimacy, but it is also through this intimacy that the next generation is brought into the world. It's a gift of God. But what I want to say is this. The sensuality in our culture today is so out of proportion to our own sexual drive. And I know this to be the case. For instance, I know that there are um, elderly men who are completely hooked on pornography. The, the sexual drive doesn't work well within them anymore. I don't know how to say that you know, any kindlier, but it's, it's actually true. And yet they continue to, to launch themselves forward in more and more of this kind of stuff because they're desperately trying to feel something. And I think that's what's happening in our world. It's not harmless, it's harmful. Because as one form of sensuality will no longer suffice because there's only a limited degree of feeling that we will have, we look to hike it up further until we move into areas of violence and all sorts of other things. And ultimately we destroy our essential humanity. And it's because we've forgotten God. And of course the consequences are felt everywhere. Adultery, divorce, sexually transmitted diseases, abortions, children raised in homes of brokenness, and an inability to feel, to trust, to be faithful, to speak truth, and to live a life of love. These are the harsh realities that flow from our sensuality. They close us off to feelings of God and eventually open us up to feelings that are limited in duration. But now the conversation changes in Paul. He's been telling us, look, this is why you don't want to live this way. I mean, have a look at how the Gentiles walk. Have a look at the clothing that they wear. Have a look at what they've embraced and say to yourselves, man, I'm so glad that Christ has given me a new set of clothing. I'm so glad that I have a different apparel to wear. I'm so glad that there is another lifestyle. I'm glad that I've been brought into the kingdom of God and brought in among the people of God where we have a different way of behaving. And so when Paul talks about the, the new birth, listen to what he says. You know, why do, if, uh, first of all, we might ask ourselves uh, before we go there, you know, why is it that even though the new life has come to us in Christ that we still feel sin. Well, it's because we still have the flesh. And the answer is that the flesh is the habitual patterns that come from our old way of life, and they continue to militate against the new life in Christ. But now look at verses 20 to 21. But that's not the way you learn Christ. That is, the sensuality that drove you forward when you were a pagan, says Paul, is not the impulse that drove you to Christ. You didn't learn Christ that way, assuming, he writes, that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So, you know, here what Paul is trying to say is that the intention here is that we've got to go to the school of Christ to grow in him. The school of Christ is not the school of unrestrained behavior. The school of Christ is the school of, um, that, that watches over self, of self-control, that leads sober and upright lives. It's the life of submission to the commands of Jesus and the giving ourselves to obedience to him. It, it, it makes us bend the knee to Christ and say, Lord and Master, teach me how you want me to live. So it is a life of repentance from sin and it's a life of learning how to live. So then the second thing that Paul uh, says is uh, take off the old clothing uh, of enslavement to self and desires. Look at verse 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life that is corrupt through deceitful desires. Now, as much as we want to say about this, I want to compare what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, with what he says in Colossians 3, 9, and 10. He says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator. So we know several things that we need to do. And one is we need to crucify the flesh. I mean, we have to stare at the flesh and say, you know, all of the impulses that are a part of the habitual patterns that I bore when I was a non-believer. I was born into sin and, uh, and I was trained according to the patterns of a sinful culture. And I'm going to learn how to say no to those. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a declaration of war against my flesh. I'm going to say to my flesh, 
Uh, I am determined to kill you. And all the impulses and desires that you have, I'm going to cut them off. You'll remember that Jesus said, you know, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to you go uh, into life, into eternity having lost one eye in this life than with two eyes to go into the hell of fire where it never stops burning. I mean, do whatever radical measures it takes. And he did, of course, mean that you literally gouge out your eye, but he said, take whatever radical measures are necessary to destroy the impulse of the flesh. Uh, cut yourself off from all these things that continue to militate against Christ. And then, of course, he says, take off the old clothing. And uh, I, I love what uh, theologian Edward Schweitzer once said about this. He said, the old man was drowned in baptism, but the rascal can swim. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just when you think you've taken the old clothing off, it seems like at some point in time, it just seems to magically appear back onto your body. But that's Paul's point. You need to keep on putting off old clothing. Don't wear it. Don't give yourself to pornography. Someone said, you know, Pastor, I can't stop myself. My, my response to that is, well, then never allow yourself to be in a place where it is presented before you. Take whatever radical measures are necessary. And then the third giving of ourselves to continual renewal is in verse 23, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And, and the mind is a place where a great many battles are fought. You know, the old adage that as a man thinketh, so is he, is in fact true. And so we may want to begin to change what we read. And, uh, you know, if you don't read, let me say, take it up. It's amazing how your worldview will change just by learning to read. But read good Christian books. Um, I've often said read biographies. Um, um, listen to Christian music. Change what you're listening to. Uh, make church a weekly habit. Uh, join a weekly Bible study group. Uh, learn to read scripture every single day. Uh, learn to take time of prayer every single day. Um, learn disciplines of the mind that radically reorient what we think about things. You see, many people are surprised to know that the culture in which we live is constantly discipling us to think a certain way, to imagine certain things, and to desire certain things, and to feel certain things. I mean, we know that's true. So what we need to recognize is that the mind becomes the battleground. So put your mind on things above rather than things on this earth. So that's the idea behind all of that. But then verse 24, and, 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 and this is a beautiful verse, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I'm going to tell a little story that I heard years ago, and I've altered it. I must say over the years, I've altered it to suit my purposes. But originally it was a story called the story of the happy hypocrite. It was a story of a Scottish prince who was born to the royal family and who was to be heir, heir to the crown, and so he would be the next king. Uh, but there was one problem. He was born with um, severely face-defiguring deformities. Even though he was intelligent, uh, he was gracious and had all the bearing of a king, whenever anyone saw him, they would be overwhelmed at how hideous he actually looked. And so as he grew and uh, became older, they decided that they would send him to further education in France. But how do you do that given his external appearance? And so the best master craftsmen in Scotland were found and they constructed the perfect mask for him. And they put the mask on his face that transformed him from being a hideous man to being a a very handsome young man, and, the, and the, the constructors of the mask, you know, they were so good at this. And you know, this is a fairy tale, they were so good at this. But the mask looked just like his face, it smiled, it had all the expressions that a natural face would have, but he would have it on his face. And every evening as he, he would study in the morning, go to school, put on the mask. It was a put on. It was a make-believe. It wasn't who he truly was, but he looked like a handsome young man. And then he would go to his room in the evening and take the mask off. But after a while, he really liked how the mask made him look. And sometimes in the evening, he never took the mask off. And soon after a while, he began to sleep with the mask. 
But there were times when the mask pressed against his face and it hurt him at times, but he liked the look of it. Well, as it so should happen to be, the springtime came and it's the time when young people fell in love. And you know, this young Scottish prince began to have feelings stirred towards a beautiful woman whom he had met and she fell in love with him. And yet his heart was torn on the inside. He said to himself, man, I, if she finds out who I really am on the inside, she'll run from me and say, you lied to me. It was all a put on. It was just clothing that you wore. You're a hypocrite. Underneath that mask, you're a hideous man. And so as the days formed into weeks, Um, and the relationship between them grew, his conscience was stricken. And so finally in desperation, he got her into a room by himself and he said, I've lied to you. You need to leave me because I'm not a handsome young prince at all. I'm a hideous monster. And if you saw who I truly was, you'd be overwhelmed. So just leave. And, and, And she looked at him and smiled sweetly and said, Honey, it's all silliness. I know you, and I know who you are. You are my handsome young prince. And so in desperation, he turned from her and faced the wall and then grabbed the mask and tore it from his face. He hadn't had it off his face now for some time. And he whirled around and said, look at me. Do you see who I truly am? And she smiled sweetly and kissed him again on the cheek and said, I told you it's all silly you're my handsome prince. And in bewilderment, he ran to a mirror and he looked at himself and he found that all the the years of wearing that mask on his face had slowly transformed his face to the picture of the mask. He had become that handsome young man. Now, that's not how transformation in Jesus works. We're transformed because God has given us a new heart. But the flesh militates against the new nature that we have received. And so the flesh brings back to us the old patterns. And so putting on the new self basically means we put on the clothing of righteousness. We put on the habits that belong to the people of God. We learn to address each other in a different way. We learn to read books that are different than the ones we used to read. We begin to engage in thought systems that are different. We spend time with the people of God in church and in worship of God. And at times, at least at the beginning, it may seem like it's all just a put on. But if you continue to put on Christ, if you continue to clothe yourself with Christ, you will find not that the clothing is transforming you, but it is in accordance with the transformed heart that God has given you. Keep on putting on the new nature of Christ. It says to put on the new self, put it on. Every single day, give yourself to Bible reading, to prayer. Give yourself to the people of God. Give yourself to thinking pure thoughts. Give yourself to these things. No matter how often you fail, keep on putting on the clothing. Press on. Continue to move forward. And you will find after a while that this is in accordance with the new nature. It will become natural for you to wear the new clothing in Christ. That's the divine wardrobe that God has given us. So thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada today. Take heart. If you're living for Christ, if you fail, confess your sins and carry on. Don't let the enemy of your soul say it's not worth it. Don't go back and say, well, maybe the way of the world seems attractive again. No, recognize that the way of the world leads to death and clothe yourself with Christ. Hey, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.